Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 235 of Dial the Gate. My name is David Reed. <clears throat> Excuse me. Kendall Cross played Julia Donovan in Stargate SG-1, the plucky reporter who was trying to get access to our colleagues, is joining us for this episode. Uh, but before we get started, if you enjoy Stargate and you, uh, before before we get into it, if you enjoy Stargate and you want to see more content like this on YouTube, it would mean a great deal if you click the like button. It makes a difference with YouTube and will continue to help the show grow its audience. Please also consider sharing this video with a Stargate friend, and if you want to be notified about future episodes, click the subscribe icon. And giving the bell icon a click will notify you the moment a new video drops, and you'll get my notifications of any last minute guest changes. And clips from this live stream will be released over the course of the next few weeks on both the Dial the Gate and GateWorld.net YouTube channels. As this is a live show, um, Kendall is with me now, and if you're in the YouTube chat, this will give you an opportunity to submit questions to my moderators, who will get them over to me, and I'll get some of those questions over to her. Kendall Cross, Julia Donovan in Stargate SG-1, the one reporter who got cl closer to the truth than anybody. Welcome, Kendall. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me, David. It is so cool to have you because... I don't know how close to the truth I got, but... <laughs> well, that's fair. She, she, I don't think she ever knew really about the Stargate, but she, I mean, she met aliens. She went for a ride in space. That was pretty darn cool. It's true. It's true. So, yep. Um, got to see a real alien. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. The premise of the show, so much of the show is about... Um, misdirection of the public and secrecy. And it was f finally in season six that we got to see someone get, uh, who was a civilian, not any government official, really get close. And that, from an audience member's perspective, A, was cool, but also threatening because we're on the sides of, of our heroes. And so tell me about, you know, getting this role and tell me about what you thought of Julia. Okay. So let's, first of all, uh, remember, this is a long time ago. Absolutely. I, mean, I think Absolutely. I did the first episode in 2001 or two, somewhere in there. I yeah. think 2000, yeah, 2001, 2002. 2002. Um, yeah. So, um, so to be honest, as, as a, as a theater actor, I, I desperately wanted a part where I got to wear prosthetics and I got to have like some cool contact lenses in like, <laughs> so when, when I landed the part of Julia, I, um, you know, obviously super excited, but once again, just like, God, I wish people could see me outside of, you know, being this like pretty journalist. I want to, I want to do the crazy fun parts. And, um, and I really battled that a lot in, in the early years of my career career because I was I was really pushed people my agent my casting agents were always trying to push me to get a lead in a series to be like the number one and I really wanted to be like number four or five on the cast list and like and like not work every day but work enough and uh and have the opportunity to play some of these more character style roles so so Julia was um maybe not the part I necessarily wanted and and certainly didn't think it was going to recur in any way mm -hmm. um but it turned out to be a great experience. It was super fun. I knew not. I I knew about the show. I'd seen. Um, I'd seen the original with James Spader, mm -hmm. um, the movie. So I knew. I knew the premise of it. Um, but coming into it, I really, I really didn't know much else. Um, so uh, and back in in at that time, we weren't really. If you had a guest star or a, a you know a larger role. Um, they didn't have cast read throughs where they invited us to those. So I didn't even get a script till very close to the shooting date. And, and I didn't have any background on the show. Um, but isn't that kind of perfect? I guess so. In yeah, this situation. So, so, so I kind of went into it a little bit green. Um, and Michael Shanks, actually, um, him and I grew up together in Kamloops. He went to school with my brother. Um, he was a couple of years older than me and, uh, and so, and lived just up the street from me since we were like nine or 10 years old, wow. which is super funny. A uh, little bit of trivia for you. And, uh, and then when I was in theater school at UBC, 
uh, he was in about second year in business at UBC and he decided to swap and go into theater. And so he ended up in my class. We were a very small group. You had to audition to get into this program and they only took 10 people a year. And so him and I were in the program together, same year. So, um, so we became very close. I mean, those people are like family. Yeah. So when I did get the part on the show, I'm like, Hey, guess what? I got a part on the show. And and we didn't see each other once. He wasn't even no. in that first episode more than I think one. I think he had one day on that episode. That first one, he was not in season six. He That's was right. He was so, out of the show. The next season, he came back. Uh, it was the next season. In it season was, eight. Uh, the guy, right. He replaced the, did he replace? Corn Nemec replaced, uh, replaced Michael. Replaced Michael as Jonas, correct. That's correct. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, I didn't even get to work with him, which was so funny. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I asked a lot of questions to kind of understand what I was getting into, but I really, I really didn't know much about the show. Um, and I have to also point out that I grew up with my mother watching Days of Our Lives. So, um, do you know where I'm going with this? Uh, I, is it, is that he, a John Delancey connection? Yeah. yeah so John, That's what I thought. Had been on, yeah, he'd been on Days of Our Lives for, I don't know, a decade or something. So, so when he showed up, I think we shot actually, uh, I think we shot my scenes with him first before I did anything else. And I was just like, I worked with a lot of people and I'd never been starstruck before. I'm like, it's Q. It's Q <laughs> from Star Trek. It's, it's, it's yes. Eugene Bradford from Days of Our Lives. I was just so excited to, uh, to be on a show with him. Um, so yeah, so I, I mean, for me, uh, I'm not sure how much, line I learned what I was up against I mean literally I just needed to know that that I was the first person to be given access to the Promethe Prometheus and I was the first person to see beyond um, this facade that had been created for for um, the characters in Stargate and so I mean I understood it was special um, and that I had a special role and weirdly enough too um, you know you never really saw uh, myself and uh, uh, who was the other character Richard Dean, I guess everybody Jack. Else, I was, I was thinking, did everyone else get killed on the, as the as the ship took off? So, so um, your boss definitely got killed because he was in on it right. with the NID, so he got his just right. desserts. Um, but after the incident, everyone was beamed. Pretty much everyone else, except for uh, John Delancey and and him. Uh, were beamed back to the surface off screen at the beginning of the next episode before right. the Prometheus so went on was, her mission. I thought so. it was really interesting that we didn't see me again for so long. Yeah. Um, and and sort of never really got to understand, uh, uh, you know, what exactly happened to me I after that. I think she signed her NDA and probably... Yeah. I, uh, another, another person would have probably gone into therapy... But I don't know about her. Ju Kendall, I keep on wanting to call you Julia. <laughs> God That's sakes. Okay. I think part of it is because what we're doing right now is what she did. And so right. I'm, I, I feel, I've always felt very, very close to this character. She's one of my favorites from the show. Because I think that um, you and, and, and the writers could have made her cutthroat. Um, and she she is to a degree, but I think she's more sincere, and I think mm -hmm. she's really a First Amendment kind of gal, and truly believes that um, the 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 truth is better than anything hiding beneath the surface, as far as the public is concerned. Did you did you pick that up as well, or did you yeah, do you have I a really different felt, interpretation? Um, um, that. There's there's an innocence to the character, yeah. not really understanding how deep everything went, but just uh, I really wanted her to be um, just a, an eager beaver, like wanting to get in there and get the the first story and new new to uh, young in the industry, uh, young as a journalist, and and just like this is the big break. This is the you know cat's ass if I'm allowed to say that. But no, absolutely. Like, <laughs> yeah. So uh, so I really felt. Um, you know that there was a there was a an innocence to her, and mm -hmm. um, and maybe not quite understanding the depth of what she was getting into until she was fully in it. Mm -hmm. 
and maybe not really believing it was true until the moment she realizes, I think Jonas was <laughs> the, the moment she realizes he's, he's really an alien too. I, think right. of... <laughs> I love that part of the scene actually. Where just like, you, you too, what the hell's going on? Exactly right. There's a lot happening here. It's yeah. the, the uh, scene with Colin Cunningham, major Davis in the, in the car suggested that she did know that this could go deep because I think one of the, one of the best lines from that episode is, you know, you should know if I've made arrangements, if something happens to me, she was willing to go all in for this, including risking her life. And it's like, it, that's, that's just wild, you know, because there are reporters, there are people out there who are willing to do that to get to the truth. Yeah. And maybe just feeling, uh, that's a really good point you made. Um, uh, the, that scene, especially when I watch it back, I think that uh, when I say there's an innocence to her, I'm not sure she understood yeah. maybe the depth of what could happen to her if she pursued it. Um, and maybe a little bit of uh, naivety as far as yeah. how long she'd been doing this this career. Um, she might have approached it a little more trepidly <laughs> off the top. Well, that's... Uh, just the thing you you have she has no way of knowing just how far down the rabbit hole goes exactly so exactly and it was thanks for sending those episodes because i i look back and i thought oh, you know i i don't know if i remembered how uh how much i was in that first episode i sort of had this i don't know i just sort of remembered you know two or three scenes and but then when i watched it back i was like oh yeah i was actually and then seeing all the actors and going oh mm -hmm. yeah enid Rid enid ray um was in it and Kyle Cassie and all these people that, you know, uh, down the road, I still run into all of them regularly. Right. Um, just, just all of us kind of starting out in our careers for the most part. I don't think any of us had been around more than maybe five to eight years in the business at that point. Um, and just to also see where people have gone since then, uh, in their careers. And it's just fun to watch it back. It was, yeah. How, and of course, I'd always do things differently if I could go back. Well, you know, of of course, you know, that's the hindsight is twenty twenty. I want to set Julia aside for a moment. Uh, tell me, uh, how old were you when you first realized that you wanted to act as a, as a career? You 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 established that you were down the road from Michael, so there was so there was there was that, and he switched in college, I guess, as well. Um, but when did you know that you wanted to do this? Well, I, I, I have a very uh, prominent memory of watching Drew Barrymore uh, being uh, interviewed by Johnny Carson when I was very small um, and just thinking, I think she was about my age. I think I was probably eight or something yeah. um, and watching, I, I, I just, I was just enamored by the fact that this kid was doing this and she was on a show. And so for a long time, I was like, how much of this is that I want to act and how much is it that I just like the limelight? Like, what is it for me? And um, and then I hit uh, drama in grade eight. And uh, and Michael Shanks and I had a, an amazing drama teacher uh, for our junior junior years in high school um, who would just produce stuff that was unlike any other drama teacher in mm -hmm. in our city, at least. We would go off to festivals and we'd win the festivals in B.C. and she had uh, uh, attached to our school was the Sagebrush Theater, which was uh, the city theater. So we were doing these shows that were huge for young kids our age and ending up in the newspaper. And the wow. so there was just this vibe. Um, and I think Michael Michael had a lead in, in his year. He had a lead in the show. And um, and then myself by grade 10, I think we were, it was junior high. So grade yeah. 10 was the highest grade. So we both had our lead roles in grade 10. And I think she really, for both of us, I know he kept in touch with her for years. She's passed away since, but mm -hmm. um, for both of us, she was just a real uh, instigator of that fire. And she, she really ignited a fire in both of us to, to perform. Um, so for me, yes, I saw Drew Barrymore and went, Ooh, I want to be on TV. Um, but but did I really know that I loved acting, that I loved, um, you know, affecting people? Um, that probably came later in high school. And then I thought, OK, I'm going to be a drama teacher. That's what I want to do. And sure. so, uh, so that's that's why I pursued um, university 
and getting a degree in acting because I just wasn't 100 percent sure. And I thought, mm, I probably should get a degree. So I have this to fall forward on or back on, depending on what happens. And of course, TV and film did not exist where I grew up. So um, I graduated from high school and my my parents, my dad had already moved his business down to Vancouver. So he was waiting for uh, for me to graduate and then uh, um, commuting back and forth from Vancouver to Kamloops so that uh, I could graduate with the people I grew up with. And then I moved to Vancouver when I was uh, 17. And then that's when the film industry kind of came into light. Um, so so for me and and for Michael, too, we, we finished our theater program. I think he did the same as me. We looked for agents about a year before we graduated uh, with our BFAs and uh, both landed agents. And, and then we both dove into film and TV. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of the tra tra trajectory for me wow. as far as acting went. Are you still in Vancouver? I am, yeah. It I did is... move to L.A. for a short period of time. Um, oof, I guess in my around age 30 to 33 I lived there um and it I, I loved it there's lots about LA I really enjoyed but for me it was just not about being famous it was about being close to family but mm -hmm. still being able to have a career and um yeah that mattered more to me so being away from family and living in the city that was just going all the time and and hard to find a lot of authentic genuine people oh gosh that's the um, truth I lived there for a couple of years myself so, yeah. And so yeah. I, I struggled. Uh, I had uh, one close friend that had moved down there and uh, still lives there. Mm. And I was able to kind of, uh, you know, live with her and her husband and get a sense of the industry through them. Mm. Um, it just wasn't for me. I don't know. But so you I, tried I, it. I felt like I got more work up here. So it seems yeah. silly to be struggling in this big city when I could just be here and not struggling so much. <laughs> but it's, it's still a struggle. But. Well, it's important that you did it, you know. So that you could say, okay, I've, I've touched that. I've done that. I recognize what's yeah. most important to me. I want to be a little bit closer to my family. And you're right. I mean, the thing about that I've watched with Vancouver is uh, covering since covering the show back in the early 2000s is just watching Vancouver explode. Yeah. I mean, it has just absolutely uh, cemented itself as a huge um, film and television presence. It's true, and and for so many years it was so sci-fi based, and then and then that turned it it switched and it it became, uh, it just became broader in what in what we were as actors able to audition for. Um, lots of movies of the week. I mean, Vancouver was huge for MOWs, and then um, yeah, and then we started to see some other series come out that weren't sci-fi. I mean, I think back to when I was starting out, and it was like. You know, uh, Poltergeist, Outer Limits, X Files, Andromeda, um, and you know, and look through the years, definitely we've stayed in. A, we do have a high uh, volume of sci-fi. Um, you know, the One Hundred, Beyond, Another Life. Like I could just keep going, um, but uh, but in came Hallmark, right? <laughs> and, yeah, and so that that's really boosted the industry. And uh, I mean, Hallmark produces about 80, 80 shows a year here in Vancouver. Um, so yeah, so there's work here, and it's kept me busy enough. That's for sure. Absolutely, yeah. I um, I'm I'm always blown away by the number of people who who I uh, have on who say, yeah, I'm I'm in, you know. A Christmas movie coming out, or I've got this going on with Homer, and it's like it's become such a such a huge um, asset to the community. I understand the sci-fi stuff originally because of uh, the 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 va the difference in value from the Canadian to the U.S. dollar. You know, they can get really more bang for their buck up there uh, with uh, Canadian effects people, and so that makes a lot of sense. But you know, with like a lot of these shows, like Virgin River, you know, which I mean, you were in, and you know, Martin Woods a big part of you know there's there's room for it to expand and grow beyond just sci-fi so well i think too in the you know with covid and and uh. just the uh mental health awareness that's come up a lot of people are just looking for something that uh, you know not to um hallmark is what it is right it's Correct. it's it's easy uh relaxing media to watch that's um you know it's always going to end positive 
You know uh, what you're getting on, with it. Totally. And to work on those shows is very enjoyable because they're a well-oiled machine. I mean, their their days are, are pretty short. You're not working what we call fratter days where you start what? on you start on set at four in the afternoon and finish on a Saturday morning oh. at four in the morning. Um, you know, they're done by seven, eight o'clock. Everyone goes home. The crew is happy because they're going home and seeing their families. Um, it's just it feels good, even though the parts aren't challenging. Mm. And as I as I age, I find that I'm I'm more drawn to doing some of that work on the day to day because it's uh, just easier on on everything, my mm -hmm. mental health, my physical health. <laughs> so um, so, yeah, uh, Vancouver's just changed so much and it's grown so much. Um, and I think it just offers a lot of the actors here the opportunity to make a living and still live in this city. And it's a beautiful part of the world. Every, every time, you know, I'm up there, I'm always excited to go out and try to see some of it and get away from interviews and, and Stargate stuff. But yeah, where if, are you located? I'm currently in Nashville, Tennessee, Nashville. but I've lived in LA. I've lived in Phoenix. I've lived in the Philippines for a year, um, lived all over and Vancouver, that, that part of the world is still one of my favorite places. So I guess because yeah, I like rain. Beautiful. So. And I'm I'm a I'm a avid sports person, so I downhill ski, I kite surf, wow. I hike. Um, you know, this city is it's it's perfect for me and my my family. So wow, that's great. Um, but yeah, I forgot to say too. I did go I did go on to uh, to get my teaching certificate um, after I left UBC, and uh, uh, I did teach high school for on and off for about a decade. Um, okay. But the, the film career was just taking off and it just wasn't working enough. Uh, so, yeah, so you got to work, work a certain number of hours or they don't really want you teaching. <laughs> so, and then I, I really got into doing a lot of voiceover. That just sort of happened. Um, not animation, um, mostly commercial and narration work. And, um, and that took off. And I absolutely love it. If I could do voiceover every day, that's what I would do. Um, so that's kind of most of my... Um, I guess weekly work mm. is in voiceover now, and uh, and I teach at a voiceover school in Vancouver. So tell me about that. Accredited. Yeah, it's an accredited voiceover school, so they have a full time program, um, six month program, and we have twenty students. Well, twenty in person students, ten online, um, and we push them through the program, and I teach the commercial side of uh, of that. So I am teaching still, which is great. There is something. Uh more intimate about voiceover i think in many ways than a lot of the other other stuff because you're you're speaking right to an audience um that i worked in radio for six years it's like oh, the did. first real job that i had i got it during high school and you 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 can't necessarily you don't necessarily know that the audience is there but you know that someone is listening to you and you have a chance to connect with them and i've i've always been drawn to that. i think that there's something very intimate about just the human voice uh, connecting with with another person used to tell a story. It's true, and and you know I found um, it really became about my abilities, and and early on in my career in film and TV, a lot of it was about how I looked. Um, you know, so much of it, and that's changed a lot too in the industry. Mm -hmm. But um, that that you know, it it was I was. I struggled to uh, to get challenging parts because people only saw me a certain way. Yeah, just and um, yeah, and so voiceover is just so much about my abilities, and I'm good at it. You know, like I feel like I'm good at it, and it's led to me um, directing as well. So I've been directing uh, demos. I just finished directing a documentary, um, directing the voice for the documentary, and uh, and I just. Uh, I love it. Like it's, it's. Uh, I feel like I'm, I'm finding my, the right element for me. There is something special about coaching other people and watching them succeed. You know, mm -hmm. especially with something that you're passionate about. You see their eyes light up. They're passionate about it, and especially if they've got talent. You know, you find you 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 find the hair triggers to to get them you know, going off in a different direction or exploring a different facet of themselves through the performance, you know, that's so very, true. very freeing and rewarding. Yeah, it's very fulfilling. Yeah. And I, um, and I think that uh, if I could go back, uh, 
women were not directing when I started in this industry. It just wasn't even a, it wasn't even thought about. If a woman was directing, it was incredibly rare and very rare to have uh, a woman operating a camera. Um, you know, they were costumes and they were makeup and they, and, and so that has shifted so immensely. Um, but I feel like I'm, ju I'm just a little too old to jump into it now. Maybe I'm wrong, but, um, Never know. so this is, this is really, I think I would have been very good at directing if I had, um, different opportunities when I started in the business. And so this is really offering me that opportunity to, to direct. And, and I think it's, it's, yeah. It's incredibly fulfilling. Like I'm, yeah, well, super happy. Kendall, never say never. I mean, <laughs> if look at Amanda Tapping, you know. Oh, I know. I mean, trailblazer. And so you know, great. I, I, speaking of Amanda, I loved the the uh, the combat between the two of you. Like pretty much every episode, there was, especially when we got into your your return in season eight. Um, the the it's not rivalry is not the right word but you you're both on a mission um to do what you're there to do and i loved i loved watching it tell me about the 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 scenes between you and amanda um yeah amanda i think really didn't want us to be these catty women that were right. you know going at each other that we both were strong women who um, had an agenda, a valid agenda, both of us. Um, and so she was very great at, at, I guess, informing me of some of this when I got to set, because like I said, you come to set, you don't have a lot of information. Right. You're kind of, if I, if you're not someone who's watching the show, which I was not, um, and, and to be fair, I'm not sure if I was, I, part of me thinks I didn't watch the show cause I just couldn't get past knowing Michael. <laughs> <laughs> So it's hard for me to like, you know, really get into the show itself. Um, um, it would just make me laugh. It's like Michael doing this part. That I, yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, she was great at just kind of giving me background. And she was very adamant that like that we stay strong, not not catty, not trying to, you know, uh, clod each other. And, and in a way, just show respect for each other, which I think mm -hmm. we managed to bring across. Mm hmm. No, absolutely. There's, there's, uh, you know, there is, she is there to make sure that this doesn't get out, spin out of control. And, you know, the, <laughs> it's one of my favorite scenes just before they go on air at the beginning of Covenant, Julia says, well, you know, if you, if you decide to disobey orders, you know, I'll roll with it. So she's always <laughs> just like egging her on. It's like, come on. Give me something here. Just you know, something. I almost lost my life in orbit a couple of years ago. Cut yeah. me some slack. <laughs> Throw me something, God's sake. <laughs> That's exactly right. Now the, uh, but I I love um, I I just I just I, I love the character and what she means to the franchise in terms of of uh, getting the truth out and potentially revealing the secret to the world because so much of what the franchise is based on is you know having this thing at some Hidden. point it's gonna you're right and at some point it's gonna yeah. get out so i would think that when that time comes um that you would if the show ever comes back and mgm and amazon <laughs> are working on it that uh, are they really <laughs> well maybe not the brad wright version that's right. the question but if it right. was i would think that julia would have a seat at the table yeah, hey, she totally should. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I remember too, I think Road Not Taken, that was the last. Yes. One. Yeah, um, Amanda had just had uh, Olivia, Olivia. And I was pregnant during that episode oh, okay. um, with my first. And uh, and I think that, that also just played into us both having uh, connected outside of the characters too on set and just like, you know. Uh, sharing sort of what it's like to to be uh, a mother or an or almost a mother in this industry, yeah. and she was you know she was holding her own through uh, that time. And as a as a mother of a newborn baby, was uh, she's just a, an amazing strong woman, and I really admire her. And um, so she was incredibly helpful too down the road. Just we connected after after that episode, 
Um, she stayed in touch with me after uh, I gave birth and passed on a lot of her baby stuff. Uh, and, uh, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, she's lovely, and it's been really uh, exciting to watch her, um, you know, move into this director position and, and producer uh, position and, and take on such a, a strong role as a woman in the industry. It's, it's admir admirable. And I think, you know, she's, we all laugh because when the, when the award ceremonies come around, Amanda, Amanda wins is something every year, but for many, many years, I think she, she, uh, you know, she was constantly not being the winner and to see her, uh, pursue and stay strong is really, really cool. If you work your butt off, and you are you are persistent and you are consistent. Um, you have a shot, and yeah. uh, I I I'm just blown away by, and not and also but not surprised, you know, because Amanda was always you know uh, genuine, and I really think that that gets you that gets you far. So I'd like to think so, you know, and that's that's uh, I think in in this city. If you were to ask any actors that have worked with her, that's the first thing they would say. She's just authentic. She's an authentic human being. What you see is what you get. And she's really supportive of uh, everybody, men, women. And, um, and she's, uh, yeah, I think she's just really mm. proud of Vancouver. You know, the people here that she's worked with. I mean, she's worked with, what has she done? 200 and something episodes of just Stargate alone. Right. Um you know, you work with pretty much everyone in the city by that point. <laughs> right. She's uh, she's just well respected. I yeah. wanted to talk about your last episode, Road Not Taken, which is an alternate version of the character that you had been playing. And this is an interesting episode because this uh, is in a world. This this episode takes place in a world where um, aliens have been revealed. Uh, the government has had to do a number of different things to keep order and law and order in place. And this is a different reporter than the one uh, that we're accustomed to seeing, because this is this is one uh, a person who has had the boot put on her neck and she's much more cautious in terms of in terms of, oh, free press and freedom of speech and everything else, really drew that in. Did you get a sense of that when you got the script? Was there anything deliberate that was like, okay, I see that this is a person who has led a completely different life than the one th you know that we've, uh, in terms of her career, than the one that we've seen before? Yeah, and actually right that about a day before I shot Amanda, Amanda I was like, Tell me everything I need to know, because, <laughs> like I said, you don't get a lot of information from from the, uh, you know. Sometimes you only get the script. Yeah. If you even get the script, a lot of the times the script at that point, uh, the scripts were very secretive because Stargate had become uh, big know, deal, a big deal, and so uh, you know, it's always very frustrating as an actor. Um, even working on the one hundred, we get the scripts the night before, and you only get your scenes. And you're like, "Well, how am I supposed to know who I am and what's my role in this whole enterprise?" And um, so Amanda was really great. I was like, "I need to know what the heck's happening in this scene." And um, and so I chose to play her very, um, I guess, like you said, just just. Uh, um, I think I, I added a, a kindness to her, uh, a gentle, uh, caring, um, much more soft uh, personality, personality, whether I felt I was being, you know, mugged and not allowed to say anything or whether I just was a, a lot less cutthroat um, or, um, you know, digging for the story. I think, I think some of that, that layer to the character was just... Uh, dismissed um, mm -hmm. so much softer and uh, yeah I guess a bit more shackled yeah she's playing this version of her is playing a game and making sure that if she goes too far I mean she might disappear you know right. in this in this kind of a place and it's I thought it was a great scene because you have Amanda Tapping's character who is get the word out, get the word out. And and you were like, no, 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 we have to toe the line here. And they've completely reversed in terms of their goals as characters from the last time that we saw them together, which I, I, I think that was, I think that that was not expected. 
Yeah, it must have been fun as a as an audience member watching that because it wouldn't have been at all what you were uh, not necessarily hoping for, but yeah, it definitely took a direction that wasn't uh, wasn't what you planned on. Um, <laughs> yeah, for me as a, as as a you know, this is always the thing. Like you know so much more about this than I ever would um, because uh, not, not sure I was a huge sci-fi fan I, I watched a lot of star trek next generation um i really loved that show mm -hmm. i don't know why <laughs> it's a good show um, you know and having been in the x-men series the the movies having uh, just had my foot in the door on some of these things it, it it definitely uh inspired me to to watch some of these shows but um but i mean you have so much so much more knowledge and depth about all of this than i ever would and i think that's the thing to note as as a audience member that a lot of us actors are coming into this kind of flying by the seat of our pants a lot of the times we don't we don't have the information that we need sometimes to play the character the way we want to and that's that's what amanda was just amazing for it was just like give me everything that i would need to know right now any kind of background to make this scene you know it's one scene right in mm -hmm. a in in a whole episode like so to know how to layer that is really hard and she was amazing at that um once again just very supportive of women absolutely so, uh, yeah so i mean you know more about my character than i do i think well as you know i'm i am the julia donovan of of outside of stargate so exactly. <laughs> give me the truth no absolutely <laughs> uh, i've got a couple of fan questions for you okay Fe uh phoenix gaming wanted to know um uh, do you remember anything specific about the audition process for for julia i know it's been it's been 20 years um but do you does anything stand out to you about auditioning for for stargate was this your first stargate audition uh it was my first okay. um yeah i do remember um so so for stargate they auditioned actually on the studio lot they had um these uh i guess construction trailers that were uh made into an audition space and the the crazy thing about that was that the walls were thin. And so everyone knew when you got to the audition space, if you were sitting in, you know, the five chairs that they had outside of the room, you could hear everybody auditioning in the other room. It was super uncomfortable. Oh. Um, so I remember always staying outside and just yeah. kind of walking around, waiting until I knew I was, you know, on deck, we would call it. So if yeah. you knew you were next up, you could see the list. And I would wait till that very last minute to go in because I didn't, I didn't want to hear other people. I found it really distracting and, and, um, you know, I wanted to go in and with my own choices. Yeah. Um, you don't want it to throw you. I, yeah. It's super. So it actually in the trailer, the, the top wall, I remember it had about a foot of empty space above it that went into the next room. So you could, you could hear everything. You could hear the redirection you could hear. And so, um, you know, back, back in at that time, you really earned your way into an audition space by doing good auditions. So maybe, maybe, you know, you didn't always land the role, but as long as you were coming in and doing really good auditions, you were invited back with the casting agent, knowing that you weren't going to embarrass them if they brought you into the space. So at that point, um, I, I, the auditions place, the audition space, uh, had the producer director, um, sometimes other people in the room but a lot of the times uh, i would go to my first audition with producer director already in the room versus wow. having sort of a a first audition where you know you just see the casting agent and then they decide if they're going to bring you back so i had earned my i had earned my i guess space yeah. um by doing good auditions up to that point i think um and was brought in directly to producers uh and the director at that time um, so there was no uh, callback for that. It was a one-off, one-off audition and oh. audition. And at the time, if you were doing auditions for guest star roles, you were filming the week, the within ten. That's still kind of. Am I unstable? Am I going? You're okay. Me? Okay, that still happens now, but. Uh, I find I'm cast with more weeks in advance than I used to be. So yeah, in that case, I was just in, did the audition, they redirected me, uh, and then uh, landed the role and filmed it uh, the next week. Wow. 
Wow, that's a, no that's no a, uh, no talk of it being a reoccurring role at that point. Right. Um, yeah, so it was always nice to get that phone call. Hey, you've been written into the next script. Yeah, I think depending on um, the the kind of episodes that they were doing, because they didn't know at that point, you know, they thought that they were going to do season six and then potentially spin off into a film or something. They didn't realize that it was going to be as successful as it was. So as right. they did individual episodes, you know, they they you guys were the 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 satellite cast were were tools in their tool shed that they could go in and say okay this one's going to be perfect for this episode and a, a script yeah. would come along and it's like let's it's it's time to bring Julia Donovan back on to the back on to the um to the new to the network so yeah and then those scenes uh you know in the following episodes uh not the final episode the road not taken but the uh covenant and mm -hmm. Uh, what was the third one? I think uh, Ex Deus uh, anyway. Machina. Yeah. Yes. So those, uh, um, I didn't even, I wasn't even with cast. It was literally like, I think it was even uh, 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 camera operator B. So while the main cast is shooting somewhere else, they're shooting these side things. And uh, so I was brought in. It was like, sit in the chair. You're broadcasting. You do your thing. I mean, they, they may have even had a teleprompter at that time because sometimes <laughs> they would do that. Yeah, authenticity. Um, I didn't, yeah. Have to, didn't really have to memorize my lines. I just had to <laughs> take on the role of, of uh, broadcaster and read the parts. Yeah, and do your walk and talk <laughs> down the down the city sidewalk and, you know, pull it off. So. Yeah. Oh, and I remember that. I remember that very clearly because they uh, they only had a certain amount scripted and I had to make up the rest as I was walking along. <laughs> really? <laughs> Which was a little stressful. Oh, yeah, man. yeah. Wow, I need to be paid yeah, more. So if they <laughs> asked me to do that, if I had to do that now at this age, I'm not sure I would be so successful <laughs> speaking on my feet like that. I'm an actress. Yeah, so, um, I'm not an actual reporter. <laughs> yeah. What, are they crazy? So, yeah, so those uh, and those were shot on the lot. Um, uh -huh. Like the one where I'm walking uh, was shot like right outside, right inside the gate at Bridge Studios. Um it's just funny. <laughs> there, I, I was, I was taking a look at Prometheus again before we started, and I, I was remembering a, a lot of the little details. The conference room, um, where uh, you and and uh, Major Davis and Samantha Carter and your producer Al sit down together, is the is the boardroom where uh, what it was uh, the second story at the Stargate Productions office where yeah. they would have meetings. And it's like, you know, yeah. just just film it in the house. You know, they don't. Why go out and find a boardroom? We can we can just dress this room and do it. Exactly. And they, they used a lot of the uh, the actual studio space. Um, well, a lot of the outdoor, you know, Amanda walking to her car. I remember going, oh, mm -hmm. there's Bridge Studios. <laughs> there's Bridge Studios. <laughs> It was, it's a very it's a little bit different now they've they've renovated it and updated it but it really is a, i mean it just looks like a business lot you know it looks like these big buildings and parking and that's kind of so it's useful for uh for a lot of stuff mm. uh, most of the things i've shot on that lot use use the actual lot for many of their outdoor um you know walk and talk scenes which is kind of funny so. Makes it, I, you know, you, why go and search for something when you can pull it off right here? You know, just use a longer lens, and no one can tell. So. Exactly. Yeah. Lo so the casting trailer might have even been in the background. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah, funny. It's funny, and uh, you know, with all of the sci-fi going on at the time, um, some of it was done on that uh, at Bridge. Some at Lionsgate Studio did it mm. quite a bit as well, and. Vancouver Studios, they're all uh, not too far apart uh, in distance, these these studios. And um, yeah, you just kind of get used to this being the space that you go to. And, and you're in these rooms with usually a camera operator on you for the audition, uh, someone who's reading off camera um, the, this, the sides, the opposite mm -hmm. lines with you. And then you've got these people just sitting there staring at you through the whole thing. So it, it's a funny experience. And since COVID, it's all been moved online. So now we've become editors and <laughs> directing ourselves. And I, you know, my family members have read off camera with me. I don't know how many times <laughs> I had to start paying my daughter <laughs> to read off because she's really good at it. So I'm like, I'm going to, I'm going to start paying you because she has, you know, she's a teenager. There's some attitude there and she doesn't really want to read off camera with me. Um, so yeah, starting to pay my kids to read with me. <laughs> That's funny, <laughs> but it's been a it's been a, a whole technical thing, right? Now we're be, we've become uh, we're the editors. We have to we have to learn the lines. We have to set up the 
light rings in the camera so it's working properly and get our backdrop going. And then after we're done all of that, we've got to edit it all together and then send it in. So it's a, yeah, it's a whole different world. Can I ask you as an actor about that? Because um, you would be able to normally go in and sit down with a casting director or sit down, you know, with the producer and director of the project and get that real time feedback. And I imagine when you submit a tape, other than a couple of notes that you might be given, that's gone now. Is mm -hmm. that, um, do, do you think that that's, it's made things easier, saving on gas and things like that, or harder in terms of getting clarity for these roles? Yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's been substantially harder. Um, there's something about being live in the room with the people where I think with like any job interview, when you meet someone in person, you can feel who they are and get a sense of the kind of person they are. And I think for, I'd be very surprised if directors enjoy this process now, because as a director, um, you want to know that the person you're hiring can take direction. And the, the time to learn that is in the space during the audition. So, um, you know, I've had numerous times where I say to, to uh, I landed a, a, a recurring role on the Sentinel years ago, and I had one line. My audition was one line. And I said, why did you pick me? Like, how do you know who? And, and the director at the time said, well, because you came in with, you know, this whole life you had created for the character before you said this one line. And then I redirected you and you did what I asked. And so you looked like the part, you looked like who I had in my mind when I read the script. You came in and showed me you knew what you were doing and then you took direction. And so I think for for, for directors, that, that really should be their goal is this person did a great job in their audition, but can they take direction if I completely, you know, change it around on them? Are they someone that's going to be able to produce the work on the day? And, and I think we're going to see... Um, you know, it's only been a, a couple of years of us mm -hmm. doing this at this point, um, auditioning this way. And I think that people are starting to feel that they hire someone and they don't know that person could have taken three days to, to put their audition on tape and, and give a really good take. Um, but you really want the people that give the good take on the first try. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's, that's and certainly true. So I true. think that the quality, yeah. So I do wonder if the quality of acting that, um, they're experiencing is not the same. I don't, I don't know. So for me, uh, I miss that. I miss that live vibe of being in the room and, um, you know, I don't want to be an editor. I don't want to be a camera yeah. operator. I want to, I want to just focus on the acting and connecting with the person that I'm reading with. And, uh, a lot of that, I feel like I, it's just not as, uh, I don't feel as connected when I'm auditioning as I used to. That's, uh, that's a valid point. And, you know, I, I, w I would be surprised, you know, if uh, if this continues, that they wouldn't at some point insist as our cameras and our uh, wireless network structure gets stronger to do these things. If you have to do them remotely, do them still live so that you can be provided with a direction or to the, uh, have the opportunity to give a note or something. And then, OK, now go again. You know, yeah. you got yeah. it. You have to give someone a, a, a person to feed off of. No offense. Other than their kid. You know, yeah, exactly. So. Even if their kid's good at it. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, I read off camera for years uh, for uh, a casting agent at Lionsgate. Um, it was just such a great experience to be in the room and see uh, what other actors would bring to roles. And it made me such a better auditioner. And uh, I really do think I'm, I'm a good auditioner. And uh, Hopefully that translates onto set as well. Yeah. But but just through that process, I became, uh, I, I just streamlined what I was doing in auditions and I think I got a lot better at it. And and so for me, that live, that live experience is where I shine um, a lot stronger than I do, I think, doing all of this stuff at home. So, um, you know, it's hard to say how it's affected my career. Uh, I'm also, you know, I'm 51 years old now. So the roles I'm going out for are, are uh, not as abundant mm -hmm. as you get older. And so, you know, I'm going through that experience as well. And, um, and then we've got the strike going on. And so I'm just, uh, you know, I'm so thankful that I have my voiceover career on the side and that this isn't, you know, all my eggs aren't in this one basket, but it's certainly been a, a, a struggle in the last couple of years. Um, I, more so the last few 
computer, I guess, but um, with this yeah. whole new online auditioning process. I, can I would even love just a, just a Zoom audition, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. And just, you know, ask me some questions and let me redirect me and let me show you what I can do. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I imagine for, for some people, this has been a sense of, for, for some who are not um, technically minded, there are a lot of actors who are just Luddites, you know, they're, there give me the paper don't have me you know n none of these uh and yeah. <laughs> i can imagine there's there's a bit of i can't do this like this anymore you know i imagine there'd be some people who are just retired from at this phase and be like if you want to get me in a room together to, to sit down and actually have a performance in front of a person that's one thing but t translating to the digital space i can see there'd be some people who i'm not game for this yeah yeah uh, no i'm sure i'm sure that it's caused uh, some people to to rethink whether they want to continue in the business or not. Um, in fact, I, yeah, I know that that's the case for many. Uh, and, you know, for newcomers to the industry, they don't know any different. So they don't right. uh, maybe uh, understand that that vibe, that electricity that happens in the room. But it really, uh, you know, it really does matter. I actually had this discussion with Enid Ray um, Adams not that long ago. And you know, she's been a real great advocate on the, the uh, UBCP board, the Union of BC Performers, and um, advocating for us to be back in the room. And, yep. um, you know, we're not there yet, but we certainly have casting agents that are allowing uh, the option of being in the room. Um, but it's not that, it's not that, uh, it's not presented very often. Mm. So, yeah, I'd love to see that change um, for myself. Yeah. Absolutely. Raj Luthra, if there's another Stargate series, would you be interested in returning? Oh, a hundred percent. Now as 100%. Julia or would you would you want someone else? Would you want to get under the prosthetics? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. Um yeah, I mean it's my theater background, right? It's I, I it's it's Halloween coming up, right? I right? love I love <laughs> I love that side of things. I love um yeah, just playing characters that are, uh, you know, I, I love playing with voice. I love playing with physicality. And so, yeah, it would offer me a, an opportunity to do something fun like that. And, um, you know, I think of all these sci-fis that I ended up doing. And, and Andromeda, mm. I think the closest thing I got was probably Andromeda playing, um, I remember this character, Pravarti Quechua, I think was the name. Um, and, uh, you know, I was... Uh, an alien, but they had me in like this tight leather full suit and you know, my hair was kind of done in this weird heart shape. Um, that was the closest thing I got. <laughs> okay. Still no prosthetics, you know? Um, so yeah, I would love to. Um, I'll come back as Julia too. I'm totally open to that. <laughs> What's your favorite Broadway play or musical? Les Mis. <laughs> Blame is mine too. Really? I yeah, swear I, to God, I couldn't believe yeah. it. It was Les Mis was on the back of my mind. Oh wow! Yeah, first time I saw it, I saw it uh, in London um, when I graduated from theater school. Uh, my graduation present from my parents was to go to London for ten days and see. I saw a play every day, <laughs> oh, wow. and um, yeah, Les Mis. I just I saw it in New York as well, and uh, once again in London many years later. But I could watch that over and over again. I'm Same. a romantic, so yeah. anything that gets to my absolute heart and soul and like has me in tears is um, I'm all for it. <laughs> what did you think of the the version done a few years ago where they did all the performances live? Uh yeah, good. Um, well, what did you think of the movie? I that's the only version that I've seen. I've ne in terms of, of of a filmed version. I've not done. I've not seen any of the others. I've always been really close to the the stage version. Yeah. I've not seen yeah. the version with like Liam Neeson or or any other. But I was I was blown away by their ability to hey capture the sound live and having like a piano playing in in one of their ears. That yeah. I, I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was. Brilliant. I thought it was great. I thought yeah. they did a really terrific job. Yeah. Yeah. Um. And funny, though, I met so many people that didn't like it. And I was like, what? How could you not like it? <laughs> if you're not going to like one of them, don't like cats. 
you yeah. know, <laughs> jeez, that's no, it's um, I was I just had this this conversation with someone a couple of nights ago about th- their their favorite one is Wicked is in town in Nashville right now. And they went and uh. saw it. And I told them my favorite was Les Mis. And they're like, but it's so sad. And I'm like, <laughs> I suppose. But, you know, the story is great and the music is amazing. Yeah, so. the music is the music for that is so. Oh, it just tears at your heart. Uh, and uh, yeah, mm. I, I love it. It's very dramatic and, and just, yeah, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. And the, and the, the cast, the, the singing, the quality of singing that they get from mm-hmm. these people is just, if I could have a voice like that, my God, I would be trying for musicals all the time. Absolutely. Um, I do not have that voice, so that's not happening. <laughs> <laughs> no, on my own, um, <laughs> e- Eponine song that that gal she was pulled from the uh, the 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 theater performance, and man, she killed it. Yeah, she absolutely Just killed it. Stunning. Yeah, one hundred percent. Kendall, this has been so cool to have you and to get to know you a little bit um, to kind of like turn the tables on the on. Uh, 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 on the character as it were and to have you in the hot seat for once that was that was that was cool so i appreciate you taking the time to do my show um and to be so honest and thoughtful and uh yeah this was this was really great julia donovan has always been one of my favorites and i um, loved your definition or your uh, your description of plucky <laughs> she was plucky plucky very much yeah. so she, she yeah. had to um you know, make people feel a little bit uncomfortable, but she she pulled it off, and you know, she uh, didn't uh, die on that ship in the process. So there's that. So, <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. I really appreciate you taking the time. Best of luck to you. You take care of yourself, and um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the show on this side. Great. Thank you so much. Bye, Kendall. Take care. Bye. Kendall Cross, Julia Donovan in Stargate SG One. This was really cool. This this was cool. I've um the the characters uh in SG One who have always been after the truth. Emmett Emmett Bregman, uh, Julia Donovan. I've always felt uh, close with because they're doing you know what I've been doing as a reporter. Um, so it's, uh, it's really cool to, to connect with these people and, and get their interpretations of the character. Um, but yeah, that was really great. Uh, so we have on the docket for tomorrow, two more episodes in season three, and then that's going to be it. We're going to be, uh, taking a break on hiatus until probably about March. So I have Heather E. Ash, writer and story editor for Stargate SG-1, tomorrow, October the 29th at 12 noon Pacific time. And then our season finale, coincidentally enough, with Michael Shanks, Daniel Jackson on Stargate, October the 29th at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, That one's going to be a riot. So I hope you can make it live and get a question in because... uh, uh, that's going to be a wild show. My thanks to my production team, uh, to Tracy and Anthony. You guys have been stalwarts throughout the season. You guys, you're truly, you know, doing the Lord's work. I cannot pull this off behind the scenes uh, without you guys there. So thank you so much. Uh, my producer, Linda Gate, Gabber Fury, and Frederick Marku at Concepts Web. He's our web developer on Dial the Gate. Keeps the website up and running. So do uh, uh, do check that out when you get the chance. My name is David Reed for Dial the Gate. And I'll see you on the other side.